started in 1984 and ran twice a year for uh, a period of time until about 2004. And then it didn't, it, it went kind of like uh, dormant until uh, 2014 when I started becoming a little bit more involved with, with the historical society. So what I did is I digitized all of the, all of the, uh, I guess it was a, a hard copy. Uh, so I uh, uh, created PDFs or uh, uh, an Acrobat file of each one of those so that they could be shared easily. The other part was that I was also hired by them to digitize a lot of tapes that had been created uh, recorded over the course of uh, many, many years, going back to a 1952 interview with Ernest Blumenshine, one of the, uh, the uh, very central figures in the Taos, uh, Taos Artist Society. So in creating those or digitizing those, because I had some experience with, uh, with recordings and, and things like that, they came to me and that's what I was able to, to, to get for them. All of that information just kind of sat around because we had no place that we could put it where it could actually be shared. So then comes along the Manitos Project, uh, Shane and uh, Dr. Uh, Galvez, and we started to put together a, a plan on how we were gonna get these uh, this information onto a platform or a website where it could be easily shared. Now, the other thing is, is that uh, then comes along the uh, creation of metadata uh, so that it could be more easily uh, researched, searched, and maybe uh, a, a way to get to the actual information. So that is where uh, that brings us up to more or less where we're at today where we're trying to figure out how that information is gonna be decimate, uh, uh, shared, uh, how it's gonna be uh, searched, and uh, what the, uh, the final outcome is gonna be. And of course, this is just the beginning. So then I'm sure that most, the uh, rest of you are gonna have a lot of input in the data that's gonna be put into it. So metadata is nothing more than a, uh, a searchable uh, set of instructions or a set of uh, words that will point you in, into a, uh, a particular place where you can actually use the information. My question uh, when we first started talking about this with Shane uh, was that how much information do we want to put in? If we put too much information that might uh, uh, take away from the from them getting to the actual information or the 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 document that they're actually looking for to do some research with, so that if we have enough information about where it points it to, that should be good enough without giving way too much uh, too much information or too many words that'll, that'll distract from everything else. So, you know, it's kind of like right now, if you put Taos in, in Google, uh, everything that, that even has any information about or any connection to Taos, if they just mention Taos, and then there's uh, Rancho, uh, 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 Rancho de Taos, and, or uh, Rancho de Taos, then there's Rancho uh, in California, that has a uh, that is also Taos. So there's different things that that kind of take away from what it is, and then you have to go in deeper, trying to trying to discern the particular information you're looking for from everything else that you get. So the thing is, is to decide with your information how much how much searchable metadata you're going to be putting into the uh, in into the product so that people can have, uh, make it easy to, to search. And I think that it's going to be a, a, a fluid system. I don't think that there's anything that we can do today that is going to be an absolute that, that uh, we will know that, that it's always going to work. 
So it'll be a, uh, a learning process and a growing process between now and, well, I, I don't know that we'll ever get to a point where we can say, well, it's done. It'll be, uh, it'll, like I said, it'll be a growing thing. So that's, that's uh, where I'm at right now is learning or getting to the point where we start to, to, to put these. Now, what I've done with the, uh, the Ayerioi is the uh, newsletter that I digitized for the Taos County Historical Society. What I'm doing now is I'm going through and taking each one of those PDF files and making them, uh, uh, you know, running the OCR on them so that they can be uh, searched that way. But as far as the metadata is concerned, it'll, I'll, I'll take uh, maybe a few keywords that are going to be particular to that issue, maybe to, to a particular uh article that is in those issues so that it'll be easy to find. So that's where I'm at right now. Well, that's great. And like I said, I can tell that you've done a ton of work already and you have a lot of information about your items, which is great. And part of the trouble that I think some people are going to run into is among many other issues is that they won't always know a lot about the photograph or the postcard or you know, the item that they have. So you're in a good position in that you know, you know, the newsletter, you know, when it was published, you know, who wrote the articles in it, right? Because you have the actual scan of the item. So, so you, right. you already, you hit the ground running, right? <laughs> so that's great. Um, well, I, I, you know, this, this was, this was created. It was when, when I started talking to Shane and I told him what I had, well, it was like, well, you know, that's the first part. You know, so we had something that, that we were able to, to start off with. Um, and, and this is what they were, what, what Shane and uh, his team had been looking at from the very beginning is we want somebody uh, or we want to start creating this. And then uh, we got connected uh, because of uh, the Taos Historical Society. And he found that most of that work had already been done, which was a good way to test the, uh, the system and test the program and have something to go into. I've got a lot more information that I could, uh, that I can get into. I was a uh, photographer here in Taos for many, many years. So I've got photographs of a lot of different things that uh, I'm going to be inputting over the course of time, trying to remember what the, uh, who the particular people are in the, in the photographs is going to be a challenge. But other than that, I think it'll be uh, uh, very interesting. And I've uh, uh, joined a couple of groups that are available online right now, uh, mostly through Facebook, that have, uh, 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 I guess it's historical uh, Facebook pages. I've got one in particular, and uh, since we started that, or since I got involved with them, uh, we've been finding a lot of uh, historical photographs that uh, somebody had that, that now they're sharing with us and now we can put them all into a into that uh, that store that uh, can be searched out and people people can share. So that'll be that's I think that this is the best part about what what Manitos is doing right now is to create a repository so that uh, things are available now. But I think that because people will start using the repository, they are now going to contribute to that repository. That's what I'm, I'm hoping to get out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I just want to address some of the stuff that you brought up about what you've been working on and how people might use that into the future. And the, the stumbling block or, or the, the, the piece that I don't like is how many things are out of our control, right? Um, and you mentioned searching. <clears throat> and people searching for things and and how how, how can we um, kind of predict what they're going to search for and we can't right we don't know um, what they're going to search for we don't know how um, educated they are about how to do a good google search that will bring up what they're actually looking for versus putting in taos like you said and they're going to get so much stuff that they're going to be completely overwhelmed that they may not find 
you know, the photograph of this one building in Taos from 1950, which is what they really wanted, right? So we're not in charge of that, unfortunately. Um, so the best we can do is try to be really thoughtful about, like you, like you've been doing, what, how we describe the items, right? Um, and I, I see, I see kind of people kind of going into to, to two ends of the spectrum, right? You can put nothing, or, or you can give your item a title like photo of Taos. Not that informative, right? And then sometimes, I don't know how much time all of you spend on social media, but you can find people putting like 75 hashtags on their thing on Twitter or whatever. And, and so again, that's probably overkill, right? Because, or, or let's say you have a blog and you, you write an article about, you know, a person in your family that lived in Taos in, you know, the early 1900s and, and what they did. And let's say at one point you mention a piece of farm equipment that they happen to have. You might not want to make a tag of that if the post isn't really about that. If it's if it's just something that's quickly mentioned, you don't necessarily, you know, that might not be something that someone would want to show up in their search if they are looking for technical specs on that piece of farm equipment or something like that. So maybe that's not a great example. But I hope I hope it kind of illustrates my point of like we're we're kind of looking for a middle ground, right? Enough information about our item that's specific, but not we're not throwing everything at the wall, right? We're trying to find that middle ground. Um, so that's that's one of the comments, one of the things that came to my mind when you were talking. And the second thing is that another piece that we don't have control of is the tool. Right, so the platform that's been chosen for the archive is called Omeka S. And I don't know if any of you have any familiarity with it. I'm personally not super familiar with it. I've used a different version mostly of Omeka called Omeka Classic. Um, it's, it's similar, but Omeka S is a lot more powerful. So that's why it was chosen for this project. And so some of the stuff that's up on my screen that I'm gonna talk a little bit about in a minute, <laughs> is specific to that system. So we don't necessarily have all of the choices of what we might like to include, or maybe it's better to say that we have to figure out how to shoehorn the information that we have into the structure that's already been created for us. So does that make, does that make sense so far? My, uh, I, I was still going back to the uh, uh, putting enough information that makes it relevant, but not uh, spending too much time. I, I think I, I attended another, uh, another uh, kind of a uh, uh, in, informational kind of Zoom meeting about metadata uh, from the University of Utah. And there was, uh, they wanted to put a lot of information into the into the metadata. They spent a lot of time uh, putting information in, which I thought was uh, not a good idea because, like I said, there's uh, you want uh, first of all there's uh, it it can be uh, it can slow down the system and it can overwhelm the system because you're talking about uh, 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 the amount of information that is being downloaded. So what a lot of people don't understand is when they go to a website, they download a lot of information that taxes the information, the, the website that, that is the repository. So in this case, uh, it, it, it'll just uh, make it uh, very burdensome to the, the server. So what we want to do is keep it light. I think that there might be a, uh, a blog associated to it or, a, or something that can be questioned that would be uh, where somebody can say, well, I'm looking for information about this particular thing. And they would be, and then uh, somebody uh, would be able to go in and, and say, well, this is where you find that information. The other thing is, is with everybody involved, uh, testing the system, 
I think that this is probably going to be the best way to actually make sure that that the system is is doing what it's what we want it to do. So uh, everybody goes in and, and tests the system. They go in and try to find something in particular. Uh, they try to make some sort of connection, uh, and that and that way we can learn from what the uh, what the limitations are. We can also learn what the strengths are and capitalize on the on the strengths and minimize the the limitations. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not sure um, the piece about slowing down the system. So metadata, because it's text, doesn't actually take up that much space. So I would not make that a consideration for your metadata. It's that would be more about the files. Like, for example, you have oral histories, so audio and mm -hmm. video are huge files. So it's more of a consideration for it for things like for for that piece of it. Right. But not so much about your description. Well, you know, um, I just I just need to say um, that I, Esteban says that people are raising their hands and I know a lot of people came in late. So what we're doing is if you have a question, you can put that in the chat and Shane's going to be monitoring that and sort of poke me because it's it's hard for me to multitask. So he's going to keep track of the questions and and pop them up into the conversation as possible. So, sorry, Dave, go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say that it isn't so much the metadata itself, but when you click on, on an item, it's gonna download. So if you're talking about uh, a, a, a very uh, large uh, audio file, it's gonna come down. So that's what I'm talking about. Now, it, it's not the metadata itself, it's actually what is right. getting chosen. Right, and Omeka does manage some of that. So for audio and video, I think we might be looking at solutions where there's like an embedded player so that pe if people just want to listen to the interview and not download it, that they'll have that option too. So again, I just want people to not worry that their metadata is going to overload the system. That's that's not a worry. But like, like we were saying before, the issue with the metadata is you don't want to include a bunch of terms that don't necessarily get to the meat of what your piece is because then it will show up in searches for people where maybe they're not really looking for specifically what you've got right so we're, we're trying to find that sweet spot between you know we want to show up in the searches for people who are looking for what we have and not in the searches for people who are looking for something different and again you know we're not in total control and we don't know how good of a, of a google searcher they are and all that so, but that's my that's my basic line at this point. So what I wanna do now is shift over to talk kind of specifically about the metadata that we're gonna be able to create using Omeka S, which is the system that's been chosen for this project. And so I think everyone should be able to see my screen, hopefully. Um, and so I put together this page and I can also put the link in the chat. Why don't I do that right now to everyone? There it is. So um, this page is going to explain what, how Omeka S, what it's expecting from you when you're describing your item. And Dave talked very clearly about what metadata is, right? It's just information about your item that is going to help users find it if that's what they're looking for. Um, and that, and again, we, we want that sweet spot, right? Not too much, not too little. <clears throat> the structure for the metadata that Omeka uses is called Dublin Core. It's not important that you know this, but in case you're like a metadata nerd like me and you want to go do more research, that's how you can find out more about that. But what I've done is I've created um, information here, descriptions for humans <laughs> about what each field that you're gonna see in the system is asking for. Cause some of the names to me are like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Um, so I'm, I'll just show you briefly what the, what the names of the fields are. And then you can come to this page whenever you want and read the description. And we're also going to try and attach these descriptions to the form that's in the tool 
so that when you come to fill it out and attach your item, you'll see this description or a similar one there. So that when you see something that, you know, the name of the field is like very not understandable, the description will help you understand what it's looking for. Okay. So the first field that you'll that you'll probably see is the title. And that's pretty self-explanatory. And most of the trouble that people run into here is that they try to make it too long. And so you wanna, again, you wanna give enough information, but not too much because lower down there's a description field and that's where you can put a lot more information. So the example that I'm gonna use is a photograph. And all of the things that I'm talking about will apply no matter what kind of item you have. But as we go through, kind of think about a photograph as an item, right? So the title of your photograph might be, if let's say it's a portrait of someone. So you, the title would be portrait of the person's name and maybe where and when it was taken, right? Pretty simple, but also pretty specific. Um, and then in the description, you're gonna be able to add more information. I'm gonna skip over subject right now. And if we have time, we'll come back to it. Um, I can't actually see. Okay, <clears throat> I just had to look at the clock. So um, let me talk about description again. So we have a, a portrait photograph of someone and in the description is our chance to say a lot more about what we know, whether we know more about the event where the photo was taken or the person and their life story or who they're related to, what family they're from, um, what's going on in the picture, like anything that we know, the description is a great place for that. Okay. <clears throat> then we have creator. That's a little bit self-explanatory, but um, it can in include a lot of things depending on what type of item. The creator of a photograph is probably the photographer. So if you know who took the picture, hooray. If you don't, mm, that's a little bit more sticky. Um, but we haven't decided yet what fields are going to be required. So if we decide not to require a creator and you don't know who the photographer is, then you can just leave that blank. Um, a creator could also be an organization, like for Dave's example of the Taos newsletter, the Historical Society newsletters, the Taos Historical Society might be the creator, right? Oh, let me jump back to description. Um, one of the things that I like to do for things like newsletters is to include in the description the titles of the little articles that are in them, because that can give people a lot of information who are searching, right? Um, there's a lot of nice keywords in those article titles. So that's a really good solution for something like a newsletter or a book. You can put the, the chapter titles, things like that. Um, so source is the next field, and that's a really weird, vague <laughs> field, and people use it for a lot of different things. Um, a lot of museums and libraries will use it to denote the collection that the item is from. So if they have a whole bunch of photographs that came from one person or one institution, they're gonna have a collection name for that and that's gonna go in the source. Um, if it's a journal article, the source could be the journal itself, right? Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that source can be used for. So I'm not gonna get too much into that. And hopefully when people have questions, we can talk more about that. Um, publisher, again, sort of self-explanatory, but yet <laughs> can be confusing. Um, again, for the newsletters, the Taos Historical Society might be the publisher of that. Or some of the materials that I've seen um, were created through New Mexico Highlands. So New Mexico Highlands University might be the publisher of some of the Cuadernos. I don't know if anyone has seen those, they're awesome. Uh, date. So sometimes you'll see multiple date fields. Um, you might see just straight up date or you might see like date created, date modified. Hopefully we'll be able to just stick with one date field. And so if it was a photograph, that would be the date that the photo was taken. If it was the one of the newsletters, 
that would be the date that the newsletter was published. Um, contributor, again, this is one of those weird ones that has a lot of potential uses. Somebody who contributed to the creation of the item but isn't the creator. So that might be if it's an article that was translated, a contributor could be the translator. Okay. <clears throat> um, right. So this is rights is a huge area, and we're probably going to have to have 10 meetings <laughs> at least just on rights. Um, and so what I did is I included some information on this page about different kinds of rights statements that people can use for items that they own. Um, I need people to be aware that the internet is a big place. There are bad actors. And so we're probably not going to necessarily be able to guarantee that someone isn't going to use your item in a way that you would not like them to do that. So again, that's a big discussion. And I think at the project level, we haven't even really decided, made any decisions. And we certainly want to have those conversations with the community as well and, and know what people's concerns are. And, and we need to have some technical conversations about what kinds of protections we actually can provide. But if you do own the item, um, rightstatement.org is a, a good resource and Creative Commons licenses are another good resource that you can use to let people know how you want your item to be used if you do. Um, relation, again, strange, not very self-explanatory, um, but usually that's used to link items together. So if there's four photographs of the same person or the same event or the same building or whatever, um, you can include the link to those other items in the relation field. Um, format, this is another one that can be sticky. And I know I'm going really fast, so don't worry. There'll be tons of time for questions over the next however many months. Um, <clears throat> but the format, if it's a physical object, right? If let's say it's a postcard and it's it's three by five inches, you know, on cardstock, that's going to be the format. Um, there, are, you can put the file format if it's like a digital photograph that never that you didn't scan from a print, right? It's just always been a digital file from the time it was made, you can use the file format for that. Uh, language. So this is an interesting one, especially for this project, because we're probably going to have items that have multiple languages in them. Um, so we can add additional language fields because we want to denote, right, this has English and it has Spanish, or it has English and it has Tewa, or Spanish and Tewa, or whatever the combination is. Um, so type is what we call controlled vocabulary, and that means there's a set of terms that have already been decided on, not by us, by the Dublin Core people, for what you're going to use in this field. And I put some of the most common ones here. Text, so that would be um, like one of Dave's newsletters. We've got still image for a photograph, moving image if it's a video sound, if it's an audio like the oral histories, if it's a photo of a physical object, like a piece of pottery, for example, you can use physical object. <clears throat> we also have data set. I'm not sure how applicable that's going to be to this project. But just in case, um, for example, somebody that I know digitized a bunch of um, church of like birth and marriage records um, from back in the day. And so that's a good example of a data set, right? It's, a, it's a, a group of information about a whole bunch of different people and the dates that they that these significant events happen in their lives. <clears throat> um, identifier is probably going to be um, used for um, formal collections, right? Where people have gone through and cataloged the items and they've given them each a number. Um, but if you have that, you can definitely put that in the identifier field. And then for coverage, we have two different kinds of coverage. We have spatial coverage and temporal coverage. And that just means um, the place that's related to the item and the time period. And so temporal coverage and date, you might be like, what's the difference? Um, so it might be that a photograph was taken um, on, a, on a particular date, but it's documenting 
something that, or it's part of an event that happened over time, like <laughs> what's happening now, right? Like if I took a picture today, um, the date would be today's date, but the temporal coverage could be like the 2020 COVID pandemic, right? Or the 1918 flu pandemic, right? It's a larger time related specific period in time that um, someone might legitimately search for, right? They might wanna find photographs from the flu pandemic. So that's good information to include in the temporal coverage field. So I'm gonna stop and take a breath and hopefully we've got some questions and maybe Dave has some more comments at this point and I would love to hear from you guys again. Uh, the uh, well, you know, going uh, starting off with the questions, I think it was uh, I wrote source uh, going back to the the uh, the source having to do with uh, uh, what what the uh, the article came from. So the source would be like in my particular case, it was Ayerioi. That's the newsletter that the Towns Historical Society uses, and each article has a title, uh, each article has a, uh, an author. So a particular, uh, well, like in this case, every newsletter would have uh, multiple, in most cases, uh, 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 sources, and it would have multiple titles so that each one of those could be listed separately so that if somebody's looking for a particular item, it would be found uh, that way. The other question I had was about the contributor. The contributor would be like in, like you mentioned, the uh, Taos Historical Society, uh, depending on, on what it is. But then the contributor can also be the, uh, the author of that particular piece. The uh, other thing I had about rights, uh, now that is always a very, very hard, uh, uh, subject to delve into because uh, in my particular case, I think most everything that I have uh, has been published and I have permission from the Taos Historical Society to, to, to uh, uh, use them in, the, uh, in this uh, 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 data set so that we, we, we've got no problem with that. But like uh, say one of my photographs uh, that has uh, information or that has people in it that are still alive that uh, uh, would probably uh, not like to have their photographs shared. So those are the kind of things that uh, are going to be questioned and, uh, uh, and answered at some point. Uh, any questions here? Absolutely. So on the rights question, like I said, that's a much bigger discussion that we do need to have. And, and there's technical considerations, right? Like how much can we actually protect materials? And then there's kind of ethical considerations. Um, there's definitely arguments for protecting things and there's arguments for making them open source, right? So, so again, a lot of that is going to depend on the person who's contributing it and do they have rights to it and how concerned are they about it being used in ways that they would not prefer. Um, so again, that's a huge conversation and I'm not going to say too much more about that just because we haven't even started to have those conversations. But yes, I agree with you. That's a, that's a big issue. Um, so back to the other questions that you had. Um, <clears throat> There's for a newsletter, right? That's that's a special case. There's a couple different ways you could do this. If you're going to upload the newsletter, the whole issue as one file or one item, then I would not. Um, what I would do is I would include the article titles in the description. Okay, the title of the item would be Taos County Historical Society newsletter, April 2020. 21. I'm a year behind, apparently. Um, and then in the description, you would list the titles of the articles. And you could decide, probably the authors, if you're handling it this way, the authors would probably be contributors, right? Because they're not, because no one is the author of the whole thing. It's a conglomerate of a bunch of contributions by different people. So that's one way you could handle it. 
if you decided that you wanted to upload each newsletter article separately, so you so the April issue of the newsletter has 20 articles in it, that means you have 20 items. In that case, the title of the item is going to be the title of the article, and the creator is going to be the author. I personally don't recommend doing it that way just because it's a lot of extra work, right? You got to break up the issue into all different files, and then you've got 20 times the metadata. So not recommended, but if you only had, you know, five of them and they were of really extreme historical value for some reason, you might choose to do it that way. But since you've got 50 years worth or whatever, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. But I hope that helps to make the distinction of how you would use those fields. Yes, no. And uh, I, I suppose that we could do like the name of the article by, this is the way I've done it so far, is that I had uh, say uh, 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 the, the particular article by the author. So it's, it's like one line. So if we have uh, five articles that are in that particular issue, it would be uh, number one by whoever it was and number two and three and four and five. So that would take care of that part. And that would also uh, be, however, uh, it doesn't give a lot of information about the, about the article itself, but then it might hopefully in the title, it would have something that would point it to that anyway, so. Exactly, the title of an article is usually gonna have really good keywords for what the content of that article is. I mean, hopefully, if, if it doesn't, then that's not a very good title for that article, right? If it doesn't really describe what the article's about. So that's a pretty safe way to do it because the, the, the meat of the article will be covered in the keywords that are in the title. So you don't need to include the whole text. Um, and you mentioned that you were doing OCR on the PDFs, which is great. Um, I am not, I don't know for sure whether um, PDF attachments are going to be searchable or not. That's yeah. something I should put on my list to clarify with the developer. Well, I think it will. Uh, if you if you run the OCR, it will. It will you can make a picture or you can make it uh, searchable. So it's kind of like if you put in a letter, uh, you can put a picture of a letter, that's a PDF, but you can also make that letter searchable. Now I it see- depends, a, It depends on the system though, because some systems will strip that out when you upload oh, the okay. file. So yeah, don't know I, about I do need to clarify that. So I, I just don't want to give people misinformation, but hopefully that will definitely be a thing that the PDFs, the text within the PDFs, if it's been OCR'd, Will be searchable that would be ideal okay uh now i see a question from charlene sims uh about is there a maximum amount of words that can be in that description field i don't believe there's a limit on the description there may be a limit on some of the other fields which is why i'm encouraging you for example to not not make the description into the title right we want the title to be fairly brief and descriptive and then save our, you know, expanded sense of what this item is about for the description. Well, if the uh, if the title says uh, has all the information that 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 is included or that gives a good description just by using the title. Now, if not, then you can do something like a tagline that says this is about something specific or uh, you know, uh, I had an article about sheep. Well, you know, that's that's a broad topic. But this article, uh, this was actually the people that left New Mexico to do sheep herding in Idaho and Wyoming and Montana and different places like that. So it had more to do with camp, uh, uh, camp life, uh, dealing with sheep and dealing with that. So it would be uh, uh, just a little breakup of, or a little bit of a description of that particular article, which uh, goes beyond just sheep. Yep, that's that's fine. Um, oh, I just lost it. I had <laughs> a comment that I was going to make. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. Some so, so again with the with the historical society newsletters, that's a gold mine for you because your metadata is almost already complete because you have because it's a newsletter, right? And it has all of the information. It has the author's names. It has the dates, it's it's very complete. Um, if you have a photograph that was handed down from, you know, your great, great, great 
whatever, that doesn't have a title, right? So some people are going to be in the position where they're have to, going to have to create titles. So that's why I'm encouraging, let's not put, you know, because I've, I've seen items where people make the title, you know, it's, it's a paragraph and that's too long, right? We want it to be as simple as we can while still being descriptive and save that information. Like the baby sitting on the woman's lap is the granddaughter of so-and-so like that goes in the description, not the title. That was what I wanted to say. So we do have a few questions in the chat. There's a couple that are project specific that I can probably answer better, but we will start. I'm gonna go in order. Um, and so the first one, and I'm gonna, I'll read them to you so you don't have to keep clicking back and forth, um, is uh, Rachel Conine says, I, haven't, I hadn't thought about it, but Dave mentioned communities on Facebook. Do many Manitos communities have profiles on Facebook? And Dave, feel free to answer this one, but I can also answer it or I'll answer briefly because uh, it was very much a central, uh, I guess you could say inspiration or situation in reality that we knew about that really informed the Manitos project is yes, there are uh, Manitos communities that have profiles on Facebook. Um, I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but they often are centered around, uh, you know, a village or a village of origin because most people don't live in the villages anymore and they are very active or, and, uh, 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 you know, are very kind of central to the concept of what we're doing. So that's the answer to that question. Unless Dave, since it was asked to you, do you have anything else to add? Hmm. No. Okay. So the next question was, uh, Miguel had asked a question that was very specific to pre previous, but I'm going to answer it. Uh, and I answered him in chat, but I'm going to answer it for everybody else who might also have the question. And it, it was about uh, the sandbox, as we call it, which was in phase one, we had uh, something set up that was uh, an Amica S build that was um, kind of a test really more than anything else. Uh, but a lot of people put stuff in there. And uh, his question was, are we still using that, which was uh, nmdigitalheritage.org, which some of you might know. And the answer is, no, we are creating a whole new archive and it's gonna be its own whole website and things like that. So I uh, wanted to answer that, which we also, I answered to Miguel. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, uh, he's also asking if it's gonna be taken down and that's not a, a, a essentially yes, but it's not really ours. But as far as Manito's project, it'll be a whole new thing. Um, Charlene, Dave answered Charlene's question. Um, and then Brent, Brent now uh, Brent had raised his hand because he is in a situation where he can't type stuff. So Brent, please unmute your microphone and answer your question now if, that, if it's uh, good or hasn't been answered yet. Are you still there with us? Yeah, I'm here, Shane, Great. thank you. Okay. And, and I pulled over just so I could talk and write a few things down. Oh, um, cool. first, uh, first, just thanks for having this little workshop. Um, it's been really informative. I had some specific questions. Some these came up when I was talking to Esteban. Um, I have this uh, small little notebook. It measures 3.5 by 5.5. And I'd like to know, I'm going to be scanning it. And I'd like to know which file type is preferred, PDF or TIFF. And then also, um, I know uh, we want to scan things to the highest resolution, which I can. I, I think I can do 1,200 DPI. Um, but my other question was, I can scan this 3.5 by 5.5 document. I can scan it in like um, in a letter, like an uh, 8.5 by 11 format, or I can uh, scan to 4.6 or 5.7. So on something that's small, when I'm going to scan it, would it be better to sort of just have it um, in its close to its original size, or would you prefer to have extra space in the scan? Uh, I think that's my questions. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. That's a great question. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there, right? Um, and I'm working on another page that's going to talk a lot more about digital images and working with digital images and scanning stuff like that. Um, okay. But let me try and let me try and answer your questions because I'm sure there's other people here who are interested in these exact same issues. So um, for scanning, 
For archival preservation, you need a TIFF file that's at least 600 DPI. Um, you, don't, you don't really need to go above 600. Um, 600 will allow you to print a larger version than the original. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what, at, at this point in history, right, the reason why we, the, the archival preservation purpose is so that these items may be able to be printed out again at some point if needed or wanted. Now, going into the future, print might never be a thing. We don't know. Um, but that's my basic recommendation for a, an archival preservation scan, a okay. TIFF file, 600 DPI. If you, or PPI, sorry. <laughs> if you go to like 1200, um, you're going to be creating a really big file for yourself. And if you have a lot of scanning, then you're going to use up storage faster for something that isn't necessarily going to gain you anything in the end. <clears throat> so TIFF, 600 PPI. OMEC is going to be able to create what they call derivative images from that. So they're going to create thumbnails and they're going to create JPEGs. And again, we have to have some technical conversations at the project level about how we're going to handle all of this. Um, so hopefully we can control which version of those derivative images is going to be downloaded, but I don't have a, an answer on that yet. Um, but that's, if you scan it at a TIFF 600 PPI, you're going to have a good solid copy that you can use for whatever you might need in the future. Um, don't leave white space around it. Yeah. Um, if you, I mean, if you have some because of that, because that's how the scanner scanned it and you don't have photo editing software to crop that out, that's okay. But everything that you include in that scan is going to add information to your file and it's going to create a bigger file. So you want to, you want to keep it as close to the information that you want to transmit, right? You don't need the white, <laughs> you know, the, the flatbed of the scanner doesn't add information to your scan. So try and, and keep it to the size of the item or crop it if you can. Um, what else? What, did I miss something? I would, I would add uh, just a question about is uh, the, the image that you're scanning, is it, uh, uh, important to keep uh, the look of the uh, of the file as a picture, or can you uh, do you want to be able to have it uh, read separately, or to be OCR so that it can be uh, so that it can uh, be just the information that's written on the uh, on in in those three by five cards. Now, in that three five five, are they drawings? Are they uh, are they uh, uh, a, a relatable uh, uh, document that that can be that is like a uh, that can be like a uh, turned into a word document? That can it's um it's a it's a personal notebook, so it's uh, handwritten. Okay. And it's in, so and it's OCR intense, doesn't it's, work on handwriting very well. It, it depends on your software. There's some software that does better than others, but um, there's really, if it's, if it's handwritten, a PDF isn't really going to, well, I should say, um, if you have, if you scan your item to a 600 PPI TIFF, again, we can generate JPEGs from that. We can generate PDFs from that. So I encourage everyone who has historically valuable stuff, scan a, a what do I want to say? I'm not supposed to use the word master anymore, but scan a master image that's a, that's a 600 PPI TIFF, and then we can create derivatives from that for different purposes. But if you don't have that archival preservation quality image, then that limits what you're going to be able to do with those images in the future. If you have it, you have more options. If you only scan it at 300 or 70 PPI, or you scan it to a JPEG, or you scan it to a PDF, and then you don't have the item anymore, you can't go back and recapture the, in, the information that would have been in that higher resolution. So start there and then make your PDFs or whatever from those. Uh, I think okay. The picture is definitely gonna be the, the key there. And in, in your particular situation, I think that uh, a photograph or a, uh, uh, a 600 DPI tip is gonna be when I did the newsletters, I, I did them both ways. I did them as a TIFF 
uh, 600 DPI chip, and then you know for for uh, I guess for 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 storing the information or to make them easier to to get to instead of looking at each individual picture because every page was a picture. So this way, I was able to do a PDF or an Arc, uh, Acrobat file that actually had all the pages in there that you could that you could go into. And now by making them, uh, by running the OCR program on them, now they're all searchable. But yeah, it's gonna be dependent on, on how, uh, what the, uh, the material is gonna be. And a photograph is the only way to do it. Or, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to scan it as a TIFF, as a TIFF photograph. Great. Um, I know that I can scan and I can choose to either make it a PDF or a JPEG but I do have Photoshop, so I can take the JPEG and turn it into a TIFF, no? No, I would no, start- No, sorry. Once you, so, so the, the JPEG format is, it, it in, inherently compresses. So that means it subtracts information out of your scan. The TIFF keeps all of the information that it gets from that scan. And that's why we like it for archival preservation. So most scanners should have that option if it doesn't, oh, that's, I mean, you, you can't, if you don't have it, you can't, that's, you know, you can only get what you can get, but if you have the option, that's what I would encourage you to do. Okay, great. It's been really helpful. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Brent. Uh, and thanks for your dedication of signing in and drive, but I'm glad you pulled over when you did to write down your stuff, but I, I, I appreciate the dedication. Uh, the next question is from Eva Arsvager, and uh, it is, um, I'm wondering how best to define and sort items into relevant categories, subject areas that will be meaningful to the most people who are using the archive. By the way, just because I'm reading your questions doesn't mean, like Brent, just undo your microphone and, and engage in discussion. So that's, that's Ava's question, though. Yeah. So let's go back to the subject field, because I kind of skipped over that in the conversation. Um, so the subject field in Dublin Core, the best practice that they recommend is to use Library of Congress subject headings. And I get that there are tremendous issues there. Um, the first one being just that it's really complicated um, to figure out what the subject headings are and what ones I should use. Um, <clears throat> so what I personally do is I go to my library and I search the catalog for a book or something that's that's on the topic of the item that I'm looking at, right? So if it was a, a photograph of uh, an event that happened in, you know, a, let's say a parade, there's a, there's a great image of a parade in Silver City from like the 30s. Um, so I would look for a book that might talk about what that event was or the time period, like if it was a political campaign or something like that, and look at what the subject headings are for that. And then you can choose one that looks like it matches what you're going for. Um, there's also a link here to uh, where you can search the Library of Congress subject headings again it's very complicated. You know, librarians love to make everything as complicated as they can. Sorry if there's librarians here, but <laughs> um, that's another way that you can find information about that, that you can find like how the Library of Congress formats this. Now, again, <clears throat> there's there's way more issues with the Library of Congress than just being complicated, right? And, and again, maybe that's a discussion that we can definitely have and should have. But at this point, um, the reason why we do it is because that's a one way that people are going to search, right? They're, they're going to know that the Library of Congress calls this thing by this term, and that's what they're going to search for. So if they search that way, we want them to find our thing. So that's the argument for using the Library of Congress subject headings. Now, what I would personally would like to see is some kind of development of a specific vocabulary for this project that uses words that <laughs> the people involved in the project would use for their items. Um, and that would be something that we would probably 
hopefully could create a separate field for like a keyword field, or we can include those words in the description to make sure that if somebody doesn't care about the Library of Congress or doesn't even know that it's a thing, and they search on a different term that they're still going to find the item that we have. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Eva, if you have a follow up, please go ahead. Um, sorry, yeah, it, it is helpful. And I guess it's, I, I think I keep asking this question again and again, because it's the one that haunts me the most in terms of transitioning between what's used to sort the information for the archive versus what might be used to find the information, especially by people in these communities. And so it's that kind of translation. And I know this has come up before we taught and there was conversation about kind of I mean, I can imagine creating for my community a kind of user guide, which would have the Library of Congress subject headings on one side and then some relevant language that might be more relevant to the community. But the other thing I have kind of in the back of my mind here is making, you know, there being a good way for cross community searching to happen. Um, since sometimes those can, those local terms and local references might pitch people slightly off <laughs> in a different direction in one community versus another one. But that's that's minutia in, in many ways. Um, so thank you, it was really helpful. Sure, yeah, so, no, it's, it's a big complicated area. And I think, I think a lot of this stuff is gonna come down to all of you as either community members or community historians to make these decisions and they're not easy at all when you're sitting there looking at an item and trying to decide how do I describe this so that somebody who wants it can find it it's it's not easy so kudos to all of you and, and I just want to editorialize before moving on to the next question from Nancy which is Ava I'm so glad that you're preoccupied that, about this, although I hope it doesn't keep you up at night as it does me sometimes. So keep asking the question until we address it. We know we have lots of stuff to address and it's an important question. So I'm glad you're continuing to ask it. And as sort of in a framework of that, you know, that is why I'm so pleased to see how many site partners and community historians have shown up for this, because really a lot of the intention of these events, in addition to learning a lot of cool stuff from Amy and, and from Dave um, uh, and whoever else is gonna be at our, this next event is to start to address questions. So, you know, yourself, but also everybody else, you know, these questions would be fantastic to do an event like this with yourself. So I'm going to invite you to like, yeah, let's talk about it and we'll schedule it, you know, at the future and we're, when we're ready, when we're there with like these conversations that say like you and I have, you know, about your project and we figure out a good time to set up an event like this. So this can be a subject of discussion because uh, Amy's totally right, right? Like the not, not only the creation of the specialized language and the search terms, but, you know, ultimately, like she said earlier, this is really, you know, it's, it's the community archive. So the more that you guys all know what everybody else is doing, we'll, we'll be set up, be able to set up the conversation that we'll have to go into these, these things like creating the specialized language or the cross searching that you're talking about. So I know that was kind of a bit of a editorial answer, but I, I, it seemed like a good time to kind of say all of that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, let's, uh, let's figure out when, when you can do one of these in the future, if that's okay. Um, so, so yeah, so, um, so Nancy, uh, this, the next question is from Nancy and um, it is, our system is searchable by text in quotes, including in the description as well as in search terms, will there be similar capabilities on the Omeka system? So as far as I know, all of the fields in Omeka are indexed, which means that anything in those fields will come up in a search. So if somebody searches for Taos, and it's sometimes in the description field and sometimes in the title field and sometimes in the collect, collect, contributor field, it, all of those will show up. That's my understanding. And if that's not true, then what I would like to do is work with the developer to make that happen because I think that's I think that's the best practice, right? Okay, so um, I'm from the new uh, Manal Historical Library of the Southwest. I think I talked to you once. 
I mean, yeah, my other, yeah. my other job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, several times. Yeah. Um, so I know that, um, you know, you're talking about the, the different terminology and everything. We tend to put some of those kinds of terms in the search terms area. And that kind of solves the problem. Um, we don't with, we don't have a search terms field in Omeka, right? We have the fields that we've just talked about this evening. That's all we got. Okay. Okay. So that then the description or whatever is if we put those odd terms in the description, then we can search that way. Right. And yep. I'm hoping that we might be able to get a keywords field, but again, that's a technical question that I don't have an answer to at this point. So okay. Okay, so the next question is from Kathleen and she says or asks, when there are projects that overlap in subject matter, will someone searching for a subject see on entries terms that are in different projects within the archive? So yeah, I guess this is a lot like Ava's question, I think, um, but, but so that's the question, yes. Yeah, so hopefully if someone puts a term in any of the fields and then another person comes and searches for that term, that item is going to show up. All of those items that have that term in any field are going to show up in the search. That's, that's what we're hoping for. That's what I would shoot for, yeah. After you answer the two previous questions, I think I understood that. Yeah. Okay, great. I just didn't want to, you know, ex uh, skip over your question, you know, Thank you. wanted to be diligent. So, um, and then the last question was actually from Charlene, and I'll mention it for those of you who are not looking at the chat, because she needed to go. Um, and she asked uh, about Amy's contact information, um, you know, for follow-up questions or to uh, continue some of these dialogues we're having. And so Amy put them in the chat. So feel free to open up the chat and screenshot those um, uh although they're uh, they're pretty easy. So I guess I can say them as well. So uh, she has a website, amyewinter.com, uh, or and the email is awinterwebdeveloper at gmail.com. So, so I'll say that as a- Yeah, and there's a contact form on the website. You can just fill in your information there and it'll send me an email and I'll be able to write back to you. Or um, po probably what we'll do actually is incorporate any questions that we get into another session, because this is the whole point of doing this is to find out what people's questions are and what, you know, what problems they're encountering and how we can make the system and the, the project, you know, work better for people and, and address those concerns. I just had another thought about uh, going back to Kathleen, uh, uh, Kathleen's question about the, uh, the um, uh, searchable words and, and matters. Now, in building websites, uh, a lot of people, and I've seen this happen a lot, where they overload the metadata field in, uh, in the HTML so that it, uh, uh, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, put their searchable information at the top of the heap so that it, uh, it comes up first or it, it has a little bit more priority. But the problem with that is that uh, there's a lot of overlapping over or uh, a redundant uh, kind of uh, listing of different terms and uh, doing uh, different terms about that, that, that same subject. So uh, I do have, uh, when I do a website, I do list Taos, Taos, New Mexico. I, I do Taos, New Mexico without the comma. I do different things so that whatever it is related to that is going to come up uh, in the search in the search engine. So in this particular thing, and I'm not sure how the Omeka system works, but having the information there and, and not being too redundant, I think would probably help, but having enough information that it is, it's gonna be searchable. The other thing, like I said to begin with, was that this is gonna be a very fluid project. It's gonna be, uh, uh, we're gonna, it, it's a learning, uh, something that we're gonna have to learn about what it is that we do. Uh, and by every one of us going in and, and doing searches, uh, we're going to start to discover what those limitations are and what the strengths are, and then we can uh, build on that. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, it's a work in progress for sure. And going back to the searching, you know, if, if every field is indexed or searchable, 
then you don't need to have the word Taos in every field, right? If it's even in one of them, then your item will come up in a search. So, you know, like Dave said, try and keep that where it really makes sense to have it and don't feel like you need to stuff it into every field. Great, does, uh, does anyone have any other questions that they haven't asked uh, yet in the chat or anything that, you know, feel free to just speak up at this point and uh, if anyone has any other questions or comments. Okay, no, that sounds good. A Amy or Dave, did you want to uh, say anything before I make a final brief uh, sign-off statement and everything? I, I, I'm just really happy that there is a, uh, a vehicle to carry this project forward because uh, it, it, it's, when we started looking after digitizing, and this happened, uh, I think I digitized the tapes probably about uh, almost 10 years ago. And there was no place to, to go to take these, uh, uh, to take, to, to put them up. And the, uh, and now that we have this, uh, it, it gives us uh, a, a way to be able to share the information and to make it shareable. So that uh, um, what, what I was hoping for is that people see this and they say, well, I've got my own story to tell. And they put that in. And now we've got uh, not only this little piece in Taos, now we've got something coming from Socorros, from, from uh, Roswell, from Las Cruces, from Las Vegas, you know, all these different places are gonna have their own, their own information that is gonna be relevant to, to Manitos and then to, to uh, every historian that's here in, in New Mexico. Uh, 